afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to have even one person sitting in the audience. And uh, I think the topic that we're doing this afternoon, uh, well, the two topics are very important. And, and this one, I think, is, is important for lots of people. And it doesn't really matter at what age. Um, do you mind if I start with a prayer? Is that okay? Yep. Father in heaven, Lord, we just want to ask that uh, your presence be with us today, that the information that uh, is presented be through your spirit, and that we might go away from here, Lord, being able to be empowered to live better, both because it will improve who we are, but also especially as it will help others because of our example of reflecting who you are. In Christ's name, amen. So the question of who are the healthiest people in the world, I mean, there's a lot of people asking that kind of question. And the reason why they're asking it is because why? I mean, you're allowed to interact with me, is that okay? Why would we care who the healthiest and longest lived people in the world are? Yeah, that's right. We want to be able to live a long time. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we always think it's very tragic when we see somebody die early. And uh, unfortunately, I mean, I can, I can tell you examples of, uh, of um, people that I've known professionally who are at the peak of their career. Young children, and I can just remember one particular guy. Um, we were collaborating with him. Uh, he was, you know, doing well in his, his academic career. He was taking his children to school one morning and uh, one of them had forgotten their lunchbox. So while the kids are in the car, car running, he ran back inside to get the child to lunchbox. After a little while, the, uh, the oldest son, I think he was about 10 or 11, was wondering where dad was. Went back into the house to find dad. He found dad stretched out on the floor. He had had enough time to grab for the phone, but unfortunately not enough time to dial. And he had died of a major cardiac event. Absolute tragedy. Man in his early 40s. We don't want to be, or at least we don't want to go down that path. Do you realise between 7 and 9 out of 10 people will die of what we call a, a, an avoidable disease, a lifestyle-linked disease? Now, if we're a typical audience, that will be 9 out of 10 of us. Now, it's nice to have a look at some of these people who actually get into older age. In fact, uh, just last Wednesday, we were at a, uh, at a funeral. And it was a funeral from uh, one of the gentlemen who was just up the road from us. Um, we used to, we've known him for some time now. And uh, he was actually from a similar part of where I'm going to tell you, uh, one of these, these blue zones, but lived till he was about 93. And uh, it's very different going to a funeral of a 93-year-old than it is going to somebody much younger. Let's have a look. Who are the healthiest people in the world? Well, if you want to be healthy, you've got to think of the body, let's think of it a little bit mechanically. There's the damage that's occurring in the body and just being alive, just getting here, just breathing the air that we have from outside actually does damage to the body. And then you've got the other side, the capacity of the body to repair that damage. And it's really those two. The body being damaged and the body repairing that damage. And if you've got those somehow in balance, in other words, you're repairing a lot of the damage that you're doing, you're going to look, live pretty well. Is that a fairly simple concept? Yep. yep, that's pretty simple. So we're going to have a look and see, can we outstrip, in other words, if I want to age faster, I would damage my body faster than I could repair it. Would that be true? Yep. Okay, now we're all going to age. Sad to say. In spite of uh, Berent suggesting that we might have found a cure for uh, the elixir of life, we haven't. Um, although, as I tell people, we might have found one of the ingredients. I'm not going to talk about it today, but really, if you damage the body faster than what you can repair it, then you are going to age faster, and you can age different organs faster. Is that true? You could age your blood vessels, your brain, your liver, your heart, your lungs. So, we want to minimise what damages the body, and we want to maximise what repairs and sustain the body. Fairly simple concept so far? All right. So, what does the body need for health? And you can guess a number of these, but I'll go through them. We need some raw materials. We need water. We need some vitamins. Everybody's heard of how important there are. Minerals, phytonutrients, I'll mention a little bit later on. Protein, of course, that builds our muscles. Carbohydrates, we actually use that for fuel. 
and I know it's very attractive at the moment for people to go on sort of low carbohydrate diets, the body actually loves to use carbohydrate for fuel. Nothing wrong with carbohydrates. The only trouble is that people tend to use too many. And then, of course, that creates its own problem. So we need all of those things for the machinery, for the cells. Then, as far as the activity, we need to be able to use the body. We know we need to use the muscles, but we have to use the brain, and we've got to use the immune system as well. You know Australia has one of the highest incidences of some of our autoimmune diseases? For reasons we don't fully understand. But one of the things that are being suggested is that we're actually cleaning things too much. You know, we get the Glen 20 out and we get, uh, you know, various other uh, antibacterial uh, sprays and wipes and we're not exposing our immune system efficiently enough. We need time for rest and repair. So if the body gets damaged, it's got to repair, right? If you've got a factory and you're working away at it, does the factory actually get damaged, some of the machinery, as it's doing its factory-type work? It does. So overnight, you've got a repair team that comes in and repairs it. Is that correct? Do you know that's exactly what happens with your body? At night, when you get sleep, you actually have what we call autophagy. There's another one called mitophagy. But it's really like the, uh, it's like the, the, uh, the, the people who come in and clear away the garbage. Most efficiently done at night, right? Same sort of thing with the body. If you don't get enough sleep, you don't clear away the garbage. And what happens when you don't clear away the garbage? Damages the body, right? Air? What happens if you don't have air? Just want you to stop breathing and don't start until I tell you. We'll see how long we can last. How long do you think you would last? How long can somebody hold their breath for? Can you do it for a minute? Half a second? Half a minute? Yeah, most people get to half a minute. Some people can get up to three or four minutes if they really practice. Um, one of my favourite sports is, is surfing, but I'm not into the big wave surfing. If you get the guys that are doing the big wave surfing, you know, they get held down for quite a long time. And they've got to do these breath holds in order to make sure that they've be able to pop to the surface at the end. But air is extremely important. In fact, if you stop breathing, yeah... We say, yeah, you can last for about three minutes without oxygen, for about three days without water, and for about three weeks without food. Now, there's a bit of variation around all of that, but that's not a bad uh, summation. So we need oxygen. Uh, and then we need sun exposure. What do you need sun for? Vitamin yeah, vitamin D. There's actually a few other things you need the sun for. Yep, serotonin. You can actually get serotonin through the skin and it's thought to stimulate it also through the eyes. Also has an effect on some of our, particularly the acute nucleus, where you're actually having your sleep-wake cycles. So very important for some of that. It also seems to be able to, some of the wavelengths getting towards the infrared, seems to downregulate some of the inflammatory activity. Is inflammation in the body good for you? No. Too much is not good for you. The body switches on, that's part of the immune system. You've got to switch the immune system on but then you want to turn it off. And it's that chronic activation of the immune system that tends to produce that increased ageing and damage to a lot of tissue. So the sun is really good, and the sun seems to have an effect by downregulating some of that inflammatory activity. We need to avoid some of those things that cause us damage. Can you think of anything that might cause you damage on a regular basis? Or at least for a typical population? Alcohol. Yeah, alcohol. I mean, Saturday night, we're going to have uh, a lot of people out there doing that. Yet yeah, fast food for a lot of reasons, and I'll get to that a little bit later. I'm conscious I probably need to move faster. But there's a bunch of chemicals that can actually do your damage. And then there is this one, psychosocial uh, uh, stress. We are made to engage and interact. Now, the type of personality I am, I'm actually a, I'm an introvert. I, I like giving information, and I like meeting people to an extent, but I don't need that many friends, if you know what I mean. Other people need a lot more. So there's a bit of variation in all of that. But we all need to engage with people on a regular basis. And if we don't do that, we actually become very stressed. And there's a lot of things called purpose, meaning and context in that, which I won't go into. But all of those things, those seven things, are extremely necessary for you to be healthy. So minimising what damages the body, maximising what repairs and sustains, the things that damage it, 
inflammation, oxidative stress. Does anybody know what that actually is? What is oxidative stress? Has anybody heard of free radicals? Okay. Free radicals are what causes oxidative stress. Does that make sense? So free radicals do the damage. When you have something rusting, that's actually an oxidative process. It's oxygen pulling off electrons. So that's what oxidative stress is. And do you know what antioxidants do? They fight the free radicals because most of the free radicals, we call them reactive oxygen species. So antioxidants stop that oxidation. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's why antioxidants, you want them higher. Free radicals, you want them lower, generally speaking. So anything that's sort of alcohol, tobacco, energy-rich, nutrient-poor foods. You know what we mean by that? You're getting lots of calories and kilojoules, but you're not really getting anything else in there. You know, things like chips and ice cream and stuff like that. So high fat and high sugar, psychological stress, toxins we've talked about, and that can be uh, you know, chemical, microbial, those are just bugs and that kind of thing. They're all going to cause damage to the body. And the things that uh, are good for the body, essential nutrients, omega-3s, we all know what omega-3s are. They're an essential fatty acid. What that means is you can't make it. If you don't have it, you don't get it. And what do, what do omega-3s do? Yep, they're important for all of that. Guess what they do? They're actually a major, they're, they're a major foundational source for the production of anti-inflammatory molecules. Now, they've got some other membrane effects as well, but they are producing your anti-inflammatories, or at least for a major group of them. If you don't have the omega-3s, then you won't produce those anti-inflammatories. had a young lady came in to me just uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, she had quite bad psoriasis. And... Uh, so we tested her omega-3 levels, uh, found that she was very low. So she went on supplements. Now, my expectation was that we wouldn't see anything really until at least after four weeks and probably not till six weeks. I saw her just earlier this week, and uh, she has the psoriasis is actually all gone. Uh, it, you can still see some of the marking that was there. And the skin looks incredibly so much more healthy just as a result of getting those omega-3s back up so that now she can actually fight against that inflammatory process, which is what psoriasis is. It's actually driven through T cells. So fascinating. So phytonutrients, these are the things that you get from orange, green, red, purple, all of those kind of things are the phytonutrients. Minerals, that's things like magnesium, uh, calcium, iron, all of those things. We need adequate water. We need adequate rest. You know why now. We need adequate sunshine. You know that too and that's uh, anti-inflammatory, adequate exercise, I'll talk about that a little bit later, and good social engagement. So when you weigh those two up, it's a pretty simple message, isn't it? Now, we're looking for the longest-lived people on Earth, but we needed to understand what were the things that were going to damage the body, what were the things going to help the body. So, benefits of exercise. Why is exercise of any benefit to the body at all? Increases, gets the blood flowing. That's a good thing. Because you can actually have spots. If the blood is not flowing through certain parts, are the cells producing toxins all the time? They are. So you actually need the blood to be able to clear those. Exercise is one of the things that allows you to do it. But it's not the only thing. It creates forces on the muscles and actually stimulates them, not only to grow new <coughs> muscles, but also you know, with your ligaments and tendons, actually forces them to get big and strong, which is very good. Increases your need for energy. Guess what happens when you increase need for energy? What tends to decrease? Some of that stored energy that you've got. Well, adipose tissue we like to call it. But yes, some of that, uh, some of that storage. And some of us work very hard to, to make sure that we've got enough storage. But the thing is, when you use it, that's great. That's turning it into energy. That's what the body needs to do. So increases the body's uh, need for energy. Increases, actually, does anybody know what the mitochondrion is? Yeah, it's actually in every cell, it's actually the bit that actually makes the energy. And what happens is, you've, everybody wants to have, you know, you, those people that have a fast metabolism and the slow metabolism. People with a fast metabolism have more mitochondrion. And you know how you can get more mitochondrion? Exercise. Exactly. And it's not exercise making you into an Olympian. I mean, I don't run around the block, I'm not a runner. But I like to do some exercise. 
So it keeps your body working well. Reduces the cholesterol, which we know is not too good for us. Increases the oxygen consumption, generates uh, energy. Increases free radical production. Ah, hang on a minute. We've been doing all good things. What happens if we increase free radical production? Isn't that a bad thing? I get to this point and people go, ooh, that's why I don't exercise. You don't want to generate more free radicals. The trouble is when you do that, what the body does is it actually increases your antioxidant capacity. It has a cellular adaptive response. So you might exercise for a half to one hour a day, but the body then responds, produces these antioxidants that then keep you really healthy and your antioxidant capacity is increased for fighting off a lot of those for the rest of that 24 hours. So overall, you're in a much better position. Does that make sense? So exercise, very good for you. Psychological, this is what you also get from exercise. It reduces the stress response. So when you feel stressed at the end of the day, you sit in traffic. And I was desperately trying to find a car park waiting for somebody to pull out just as I drove past. It didn't happen. Um, which means that, you know, a little bit of stress going up. But that stress, the best way of reducing stress, getting out and doing some exercise. It'll actually reduce that stress. Very good for you. It actually reduces your desire for food. So if you exercise for about half an hour afterwards, or say, you know, you finish your exercise about half an hour before you, you start your dinner in the afternoon, you've got much lower desire for food. Stress actually increases your desire for food, particularly fats and sugars, because that actually gives you a little high and actually can, uh, that's why they call it comfort food. But to exercise actually reduces that. Activates the reward pathway, so, you know, you've got to get your face hot to get the reward pathway. So really good. So how much physical exercise? Well, I won't go into too much detail, but you really want to do as, you know, a much, as much as you can during the week, between a half to one hour each day if you can, at least between three and five days a week. And don't forget this one. A lot of people think that they're out there and they're on the treadmill and they're on the bike and they're doing that kind of stuff. But actually, it's good to do weight bearing as well. There's some real positives with weight bearing and uh, it does a lot of what the other stuff does but it actually stimulates more of the mitochondria and uh, improves your metabolic rate. But this is the key thing with exercise and a lot of people, you know, we've had a lot of focus on exercise but exercise only stimulates, it can't nourish. Does that make sense? It only stimulates, it can't nourish. You can never out-exercise a bad diet. So what we need we need to have physical activity, though beneficial to the body, produces or provides no nutrients. It actually creates a metabolic stress, making you more, you need the more of the nutrients. And what does the body need for nutrients? Well, carbohydrates and fats for fuel, building materials like proteins, specialised components like vitamins, minerals, trace elements. I've mentioned the omega-3s. Inflammatory oxidase, so the polyphenols, a lot of those, this is the orange, green, reds. They actually help to reduce your inflammation as well. And then we need, you know, the fibre and we're learning a lot more about the gut and so it's not just a simple bulking agent, it's more than that. But we need our fibre as well. So, and we need water. So a diet deficient in any of those six ultimately does result in disease. Now it's not to say that everybody needs to sort of worry too much about, uh, um, you know, going and changing things drastically, but just keep in mind that you want to get all of these things in because the body works best when it's got it. Does that make sense? So, eating too many high fat foods, we know what that causes. Get lots of inflammation, lots of free radical. We did an ice cream study. It wasn't hard to get people recruited into this study. What we needed them to do was come in. We had four, four diets for them. We wanted to see whether ice cream really was bad, whether it really did put up free radicals like people think it does. So we got people to eat a bowl of ice cream. We had just had 11 people we invited from the community. They ate a bowl of ice cream. And then over the next six hours, we took some blood at different time points. We also then just tested, rather than the whole ice cream, we did just the fat component and then did just the sugar component on different occasions. And we compared it to avocado. You know avocado's got about the same energy density as ice cream? Almost the same amount of saturated fat too, which is interesting, although it's a little bit of a shorter chain. And a couple of things we found. Number one, yes, ice cream puts up your oxidative stress. Yes, the sugar component does it on its own. Yes, the fat component does it on its own. Increases by about 40%. Do 
Do you want to age 40% faster than everybody else? Or then you need to. If you do want to, and maybe when you're a little you want to get older quicker, maybe you feed your kids ice cream. No, it just ages them faster. Um, but when we gave avocado, no increase. Even though we saw the fats go up at the same rate as the, uh, as the ice cream. And what we argued when we published this was that uh, we think that it's the amount of antioxidants that comes with the avocado. Lots of antioxidants, actually, in that avocado. And what the other interesting thing was, it was very easy to get people to eat a bowl of ice cream. Very easy. Everybody just hoed into their ice cream. But it was very hard to get people to eat a bowl of avocado. They could get through about half an avocado, and these are people that, oh, I love avocado. Yeah, they get half an avocado, and they're going, oh, I don't feel like anymore. And they needed to eat about one and a half avocados. So it's interesting that there is something that's put in the food when it's a whole food that makes you eat less. And they were fully satiated. They didn't need any more. Oh, I don't feel like any more. Interesting. So we know that all this sort of stuff puts up things like diabetes, heart disease, cancer, stroke, all of those things which you don't want. And unfortunately, dementia. It's absolutely, says Anthony Balduzzi, and he's right, it's absolutely impossible to out-exercise a bad diet. Now, have you seen this ad? Go ahead, treat yourself. This is a blueberry muffin. Now, I want to ask a question. Blueberry muffin, you're going to go, okay, well, there must be some healthy things in blueberry because blueberries are good for you, right? They are. Blueberries are great things to have. So here's a blueberry muffin. Maybe it does. So I looked at the nutrient profile. This is the nutrient facts for a blueberry muffin. So you've got, uh, gram you've got fat, uh, salt, that's just sodium, uh, so carbohydrates and sugars. So you've got fat, salt and sugar. Was there any vitamins in there? There's blueberries. You would think that there are vitamins in there. Can you see anything there? Absolutely zero. So what are you getting when you get your blueberry muffin? And I've had people say, well, what were the blueberries? I, I don't know. I, I don't know whether they were real blueberries or what. But the point is, it's called a blueberry muffin. You could burn off the excess energy in about one and a half kilometres. So you could jog a kilometre and a half and burn it off. But you've stressed the body by giving it a high sugar hit and provided no nutrients to help the body repair the damage caused by that initial sugar hit and the exercise needed to burn off the fuel. Does that make... So what are you doing when you do this kind of thing? And I'm not against this company. This company's allowed to make money. It's allowed to put products on the market. But I'm just telling you what happens with your body when you take something like that. What did you get? You got salt, fat, and sugar. You got salt, fat, and sugar, and you got no nutrients around that. Correct? So it's okay if you were just calorie deficient. But generally, that's not what most people are. And so foods that come packaged, if it's highly processed with salt, fat, and sugar, it will put you in a state which is actually do, going to do more damage. Are you aging faster with that food or less? <coughs> you are aging faster, exactly. Um, and I just compared it to something that was similar, an, an oatmeal blueberry pancake. At least here you're getting some vitamin E, you're getting some copper, folate, iron, magnesium, a um, little bit of manganese, niacin. I mean, at least you're getting some stuff. Vitamin A vitamin C, you're still getting a fair bit of salt in this particular one and, and, uh, and, and fats as well, but I tried to match it with the fats and, and sugar, but you're, at least you're getting some vitamins in there and minerals. If you want to do the best for your body, always think of what nutrition is going into your body, not just what satisfies the appetite. Does that make sense? If you want to look after and you want this thing to work well, don't just go for something that's going to satisfy the appetite. Think about, am I actually giving my body some nutrients? It should taste great. There's nothing wrong with tasting good. But if, if it only tastes good and doesn't have any nutrients, then it's going to hurt you. Meals made from whole food are generally the best option. Does that make any sense at all? Okay. Oxygen, sleep apnea. You don't want sleep apnea. You know what sleep apnea is? It's when you sort of, you know, that somebody's snoring at night. <laughs> and then it takes a while for them to breathe again. They're having little anoxic events. That's not good for the body. It actually produces lots of free radicals. They get fatigued, increased heart disease because of the oxidative stress. Brain doesn't work so well. Kidneys don't work so well. You need to fill your lungs. And that actually goes for when you're sitting, standing, 
as well. Actually breathing, getting the posture right, getting that oxygen through. Good posture. Poor posture reduces oxygen saturation in the muscles and none of that is good for you. Sleep, I mentioned this, linked to reorganisation and coding of daily events. Without sleep, you actually remain stressed, you don't clear away the debris in the body, and unfortunately the brain can't file away some of the things you learn during the day. It needs to consolidate those memories. I've said it to students, the best thing they can do, eat well, move, study up until probably about 9 o'clock at night, if they need to, and then make sure they get plenty of rest. Because that's the way they'll remember it. Organisation, integrative, new information, good for psychological health, coordinating, regenerating, repair, I've mentioned already. Lots of hormones linked through to it. Sleep disturbance negatively impacts hormonal rhythms, so you end up with more risk of obesity. Incidentally, eating late at night is one of your greatest risks for not only poor sleep, but also increasing obesity. Because, pardon me, what happens if you start eating late at night and the best time to finish eating is by 7.30. So you need to be finished eating by that time and then the body can actually get rid of all of that food before it's time for you to sleep. If you eat late, the body's still trying to pack that away when you're sleeping. And is it going to need any of the energy that you've just put in because of that food? It's just going to pile it away as fat, often as visceral fat which is the stuff that sits around the organs which actually creates the diabetes and the heart disease and things like that. That's not what you want. And, you know, you want to be able to get that nice biorhythm. Like a well-oiled factory, you know, things happen in the morning, that's different at lunchtime, that's different in the afternoon. It's exactly the same with your extremely complex body. Your body needs to be in that biorhythm. And so when you push it outside of that, staying up late, eating late, even exercising late can be a bad thing. We need lots of water, 70% water. The brain is actually 80%, even though it's got lots of fat in it. As I mentioned, you can survive for around about three days without water. You need to replace that for lots of reasons. Even dehydration as low as 1% to 2% can impact the brain function. You'll feel tired. Now, often what people will do at 10 o'clock in the morning is they'll go out and they'll get a coffee. Coffee, unfortunately, is also a diuretic. You will get some fluid in there, but you also weird out. The best way of actually feeding the brain is actually giving it water. Desperately needs that water, and you will feel well. Best way to study is definitely not with a coffee. It actually shuts down prefrontal cortex. It actually reduces blood flow to that part of the brain that you actually need it for. So getting some water in increases your alertness, reduces your tiredness. Really important to get it. Other benefits being well hydrated increases your basal metabolism. In other words, your metabolic rate goes up. You drink more water, so don't drink juices. Don't go in for the caffeinated beverages. You drink more water, and the body wants to... It will work better. It's actually being lubricated in a lot more healthy fashion. Protective against kidney stones, bowel cancer, may even protect against heart attacks. Sunshine, I've mentioned, vitamin D, healthy bones, good for the immune system, reduces the risk for diabetes. Cancer prevention, even, significantly seems to be associated with um, the, the uh, available sunshine. This is not going out there and frying. This is going out and getting reasonable exposure. Now, to actually get vitamin D, you need exposure to the shorter wavelengths light, so you need to be out there, actually, between that 10 and 2, the time that we're told not to be out there. But it's only out there for about five minutes in summertime and about 10 to 15 minutes in wintertime. Does that make sense? And great to get your tummy exposed if you can. Clearly it's a lot more difficult when you're working and that type of thing, but uh, that's where you're looking for. Great for increasing uh, some of the endorphins. Reduced risk of depression. We know that what we call seasonal affective disorder or SAD happens at the uh, uh, higher and lower latitudes. State of well-being in which the individual realises his or her own abilities. This is according to WHO for psychological wellness. And can work productively and fruitfully and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. So when you're psychologically well, this is you. To attain this state of well-being, a person needs to... They need a clear sense of their social and cultural norms and standards and expectations. So how do we fit in, in other words? We fit in well. Access to the resources that are going to do that, that's personal, social, physical, 
enables them to make a socially acceptable contribution, and resources, both material and psychological, that enable resilience in the face of setbacks. Everybody gets a setback, but sometimes some people don't handle that too well. Research has clearly indicated, and this is not reported by me, it's by somebody else, that individuals who report being more religious and spiritual also report better physical and mental health. Pardon? Yeah, absolutely. Now, it's interesting because there's good, strong social interaction. High sense of individual value, high life satisfaction, increased psychosocial resources. In other words, you can depend on people. That's the key thing. You've got somebody to depend on, you can talk to other people and greater psychological coping strategies because of that. If you have a look at the longest people on Earth, back in 2005, a guy by the name of Dan Butner, many of you would have read it, Secrets of Living Longer, then published a book a few years later, and 2016 was his latest one, The Blue Zones, The Science of Living Longer, where he added two more groups. And this were they, Okinawa in Japan, it's a little island, Ikaria, Greece, the original one was Sardinia in Italy. Uh, the two that are added are Carrier, Greece, and, and Nicoya in Costa Rica. And then this one here, Loma Linda, California. Does anybody know what's interesting about Loma Linda, California, and who was studied there? Yeah, it was actually the Seventh-day Adventist in Loma Linda, California. Now, if you've been to Loma Linda uh, and you've seen the town, you'd be thinking to yourself, wow, if this is a blue zone, and incidentally, not only is it a blue zone, in other words, these people are the longest living people compared to any other group. They are the longest living group who live in a typical Western context. So they're still having to fight traffic. They've still got all the traffic pollution. And that's what I was going to say. When you've been to Loma Linda, you realise, hang on a minute, this is not uh, like going down the south coast of New South Wales and living in a beautiful place and, and that's why they live longer. A lot of these other places, yes, Places like Sardinia and Icaria and Okinawa, these are sort of isolated groups and isolated uh, where they're sort of out there in the environment. This is actually a typical Western town, people with typical Western stresses. But not only were they the longest lived, they were even longer to some extent than these ones. What did these guys have that were giving them the edge? What was it about the Seventh-day Adventists? And there's a lot of literature out there actually on Seventh-day Adventists as being the longest lived population on Earth. So the key points. The people inhabiting the Blue Zones share common lifestyle characteristics, according to Dan Butner. They have uh, psychological health, psychosocial health. So they've got purpose in life. There is purpose, and when you're part of a community, there is always purpose because there's things for you to do, even into older age. Religious affiliation... Family, put ahead of other concerns. And look, that's an important one, and particularly for us who are busy. I mean, that's, that's something that uh, I probably struggle with more than I should. You want to put family first. People of all ages, socially active. In other words, it's not isolating out groups. The very oldest to the very youngest. Our neighbour up the road, Italian family, it was just fantastic to see. I mean, at the end of his, the last couple of years, it was his grandson and his partner living in the house with him just to sort of look after him. And uh, they had their baby, so now, they, now his great-grandchild was there as well. And, uh, you know, he was involved in looking after the baby. And, you know, it was just, you know, it was fantastic to see all the way through the generations. Isolating generations is just a stress for everyone. The young ones don't know what's going on. The old ones know what's going on, but don't know what the young ones are doing. You know, I mean, this is a lot of stress. It's, much, it's psychologically healthy to have everybody together. Integrated in the communities, vegetable-rich diets, especially legumes, according to Dan Butner. Constant, moderate physical activity. But notice that this is not getting out there and trying to do marathons. It was constant, moderate physical activity as an inseparable part of life. One of the things that I used to do, and I'm mostly over at the hospital now, but uh, when I had uh, an office and, and uh, research facility at, uh, at the university full-time, what I would do was actually print to a printer a floor above me whenever I needed to print something because it got me off my chair and made me walk upstairs and down again. So at least I was moving, uh, standing up on the bus instead of sitting down. Uh, I would walk an extra bus stop instead of going to the one which was only five minutes away. I would walk to the one that was half an hour away um, because it made me do something. Our bodies were meant to move and, of course, eliminate smoking. 
Uh, and incidentally, Australia's taken that on. We're one of the best in the world, where people get that message. Um, so, according to Butner, with, at the Adventists, he says, Butner explains <coughs> that Seventh-day Adventists do right. He says, eating a plant-based diet, having a social network that reinforces the right behaviour, their religious beliefs are also a big help, he said. They take this idea of the Sabbath. Now, I haven't mentioned anything about... Uh, I've talked about biorhythms. That's during the day. Have you heard of the term Circa Septan? Has anybody heard the term Circa Septan? Which is a seven-day cycle. There's actually seven-day cycles you'll find throughout nature, which is fascinating. You know, the... Uh, who was it? The... Um, well, it was the French that tried to turn it into a 10-day cycle. And uh, somebody tried to turn it... It was the... Uh, was it, who, who tried to turn it into a 5-day cycle? Oh, the Russians, I think. The Russians tried to turn it into a 5-day cycle. Neither of them worked. The 7-day cycle is not set like, uh, you know, our month by the moon or, you know, the year, uh, which is by the sun. 7-day cycle just seems to be somewhat innate. And it works the best. That's why we've gone back to a seven-day cycle, Circa Septan. And it's really interesting. The Sabbath of the Bible fits beautifully in there. And it may be one of the reasons why, even within a busy Western context, Seventh-day Adventists, particularly the Loma Linda group that they studied, uh, have got such benefit. About 84% of healthcare dollars are spent, this is according to Butner, because of bad food choices, and we've talked about a number of those, inactivity and unmanaged stress. And they, talking about the Adventists, have these cultural ways of managing stress through their Sabbath. It's a day where you get to not... I mean, you know, I've been accused of probably being a little too focused on uh, some of the work that I do. One of the things that's great about the Sabbath is that I actually have, as a Christian, I recognise God has made some laws around the Sabbath... And he said, I don't want you thinking of all of those things that trouble you during the week, even if I wake up with them. I get to put them aside and I go, ah, I don't have to think about that today. I get to do other stuff. I get to think about other things and I get to think about other people as opposed to a lot of that stressful event. Extremely important and I think it extremely healthy. So Adventists, Christian and faith, you know, they're all of these. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll show it a little bit later on. But these are the classics, what they're called, eight, eight laws of health. Pure air, sunlight, abstemiousness, rest, exercise. What does all that mean? Pure air, we've already talked about that. Good tissue oxygenation, breathing, posture, no sleep apnea. We've talked about sunlight, vitamin D. Notice that this was actually 1905 that the Adventists were starting to pick up on this. We're, not, we're only getting some, particularly with sunlight, we've got a group in our uh, research group, uh, what we call the photobiomodulation group, they're looking at the effect of different wavelengths on, on all sorts of different pathways. Absolutely fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. But sunlight was identified over 100 years ago. Abstemiousness, and particularly all those caffeinated beverages, but including alcohol. Adequate quantity and quality of sleep. Uh, exercise. Proper diet, so reducing calories. Vegetable rich, really strongly promoted. Use of water not only just for hydration, but also actually for stimulation, which is interesting. Using it on the body, hot and cold showers. I've tried them. Anybody into hot and cold showers? Okay, there are some. Okay, that's, that's brave person. Yeah, 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 no, I've, I've, I've tried it. It's, uh, it can be harder. I mean, I get out, I'll surf in the morning when it's, when it's quite cold, but uh, to actually have a cold shower is still, still a work in progress. Yeah. And this last one, trusting in God, where informing and impacting the psychosocial wellness, there is a power outside of ourselves that loves us for which we can trust. Absolutely fascinating. You look at this, and it's interesting, early Adventists accepted these health principles by faith. Because when we're looking, and when Dan Butner was looking, you know, and this is back in 2005, so we're talking around about 13 years ago, the groups that he was looking at you know, these are 100-year-olds and that, this type of thing, 90-year-olds that were still doing surgery. These people weren't doing the sorts of things that they were doing, living the lives that they were doing, because science had told them to. They were doing it because they had it by inspiration 100 years ago. And 100 years later, we can actually look at them and measure them and go, oh, gee, it really worked. 
I've had colleagues of mine say, oh, maybe we should be looking at the Adventists. I said, well, yeah, it's okay. You can have a look at the Adventists, but make sure you look at the older ones. Because I'm not so sure that the younger ones are doing exactly the same that the older ones were. Fascinating. When this publication came out in 2011, I thought that this was... What this is, deaths in thousands. So it's the deaths due to cardiovascular disease. Now, the decrease from about the mid-1980s is almost uh, entirely associated with uh, open heart surgery and keeping people alive as a result of better medical science. But what you can see is from the year around about 1900, you can see an almost exponential increase in cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease is one of those, what we call indicators, diseases for lifestyle disease. Did I tell you at the beginning how many people, if this were a typical population, how many people will die of a lifestyle-linked disease? Seven to nine out of ten. So 70 to 90 percent. Uh, and uh, I won't count you off, but if I was to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh. ten, well, yeah, etc. You know, it would be a significant number of people in this room. Cardiovascular disease is still our number one killer in Australia, and it is in the United States, and it is for every third world, uh, first world country, and growing in the third, in the third world. When I looked at this and I said, wow, so this is a lifestyle-linked disease. All of those things that we are associated with in terms of healthy can prevent cardiovascular disease. And it's interesting that the very time that this increase in cardiovascular disease was going to increase in our lifestyle diseases, this Ministry of Healing was published, which was actually inspired council back in 1905. And it's this one... All of those things that I told you about, the eight laws of health, that's what these people are picking up, and they're the ones that are still living 100 years later, if they did it. We should have had everybody who has this knowledge, instead of being like this, it would have been like this. Does that make sense? But it didn't, it goes like this. But it is a message that you can actually give to other people, and hopefully put it in practice yourself. So... Benefits of, Adventist, uh, of, of the Adventist lifestyle, improved psychosocial health, we know. Get together, we've got people we can rely on. Resistance to classical infectious diseases, because we practice hygiene like everybody else. Improved community health care. Resistance to modern forms of disease, particularly when you practice the positive lifestyle. And those modern forms of disease are all of those things like heart disease, diabetes, stroke, ultimately dementia. All of these health benefits initially realised in those populations studied by faith. Science will, may, eventually prove all the inspired points on health correct. I mean, I think science will. And as a scientist, I like to think that, uh, you know, we're after the truth, and I think eventually it will get there. While a lot of people spruik a few things at the moment, which we might find later on don't quite work. But the question is, why wait when you can experience the benefits now? I mean, we know what is healthy, Inspiration has told us there are some things that we can still build on from there. Let's take it, put it into practice. Shall we just bow our heads for prayer? Father, I thank you again for an opportunity to be able to talk about issues that are of importance, Lord. It's important not only for uh, how long we live, Father, but how much we enjoy the life that we are living. And I just pray as we go out today that uh, your spirit would impress upon us the, uh, the key principles of, uh, of the grace that you've given us and the knowledge that you've given. In Christ's name, amen.